Hi everyone. We're not so many today, so I feel like <laughs> yeah, we can talk here in between us, <laughs> to be honest. So I think, yeah, so we'll make this as kind of informal as, as, as we possibly can. Um, so I thought I'll kick things off and then if any of you guys have any questions, feel free to just jump in at any time. So I thought I'd start kind of at the beginning and what was it about football from such a young age that made you think that this was something you wanted to devote your life to? Um, basically, I was born in a football family. I had both my parents playing and my brother played, my sister played, is playing today in PSG, so I kind of didn't have any choice. Uh, I came home from all of these different sports. I came home from a handball the training and I was so excited and they were just looking at me like, what are you doing? No, no chance, you're going to play football. And, and, and that was the answer. And you always knew this was something that you wanted to do? I, I was kind of a late bloomer, to be honest. Uh, yeah, it came, it came maybe when I was like nine, nine, ten, when I really uh, realized that this is this was really my thing. Um, and after, since it's been it's been my life. Has it been difficult being so talented at such a young age to deal with the pressure and the constant need to deliver from such a young? Yeah, it, it could be, it could be obviously, but. Um, I always appreciated that side of myself where I was kind of really fearless, you could say. I always like uh, went for it without thinking about consequences. And it could be some consequence with that as well. You get a lot of punches with all uh, wanting to do, do stuff. But um, <coughs> I think when you're 14, 15, 16, you still haven't achieved anything. And you need to know that it takes a lot of work to actually yeah, realize your dreams and, and that doesn't happen at 14, 15, 16. Uh, it needs years with practice and, and will to become the best. But now that you have reached already this unprecedented level of acclaim in women's football at such a young age, what is it that still drives you? What is it that still keeps you motivated? What keeps me motivated uh, is also a good question, uh, but the will of wanting to continue winning in a team, to work something, uh, have the same ambitions, uh, to work every day in a team, uh, to succeed is something that motivates me, but also make the most out of my career because I know, uh, now I know it's, it's shorter than I thought it would be earlier. Uh, so I just want to make a max of it and reach as far as possible. So working with details every day, that keeps me hungry. Uh, a ball on door <laughs> makes me stay on my feet, uh, uh, toes, to be honest. So I think there's a lot of things to work for uh, still. And I'm just trying to keep the highest levels as long as possible. What other things do you have to tick off the tick list in terms of professional achievements? I don't, I don't have a special list, to be honest. I have, I have in sort of way, I, like, I have like long-term goals and then I have short-term goals. Like short-term goals could be, um, trying to succeed uh, a certain pass or like yeah, a dribble or something. But a long term could be a Ballon d'Or, which came at age at 23 years old. So obviously I had to like uh, restart it all, to be honest. Um, but it, the Ballon d'Or came in such a good time because it was in a period where I actually needed that uh, external motivation, to be honest, to keep going on the highest level. And it kept me on my toes, to be, uh, to be honest. And I just want to willing to do more to um, win and break records. What was it like winning the Ballon d'Or? It was amazing. It's, um, it's hard to describe, to be honest, but uh, the whole evening, the whole... It was such a historical moment, so it was... Um, it's kind of hard to describe the feeling I had that evening, but um, having... That amount of respect, I always talk about the respect in the room, uh, being considered uh, as, uh, as a woman uh, playing football with uh, that respect uh, gave me that, um, oh, yeah, gave me that confidence, but it gave me also that feeling I was looking for throughout, throughout my career, to be honest, because um, that, that feeling doesn't show up every day. And I really felt respected as a woman and as a women's footballer. So. We kind of made a huge step only by, uh, by that uh, individual trophy, to be honest. Why do you think it took so long to get to a point where even just the award was recognised? I ask myself the same question every day. <laughs> no, but um, 
I mean, we're in 2019. Uh, I think women's uh, spot in society gets bigger and bigger. Uh, it needs to get bigger and bigger to make a change. Uh, we all need to make that change together. That's why I'm really for that women back each other. I think that's important because all of us have, have, have a voice. Mm. And with a lot of voices, we can actually change stuff in a much faster way than it's, it's, it's been done today. And I think the road is long, um, but first of all, changing the attitudes uh, every day uh, at women, at women that play football, uh, young girls playing football, it's such an important thing to, yeah, uh, get a much more modern world. And that's basically something that I'm really passionate about as well. So in the last year you said that, um, especially in Norway, girls and boys don't have the same opportunities. Do you have any hope that the inequality of opportunity gender gap is decreasing or do you think it's staying relatively similar? Yeah, and that's, that's kind of the interesting part of it because um, I'm from Norway, uh, we have a democracy, uh, yeah, equality, I see someone uh, <laughs> nodding, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but at the same time, in the football world, it's quite different again. Um, I don't see um, the girls have the same academy choices, uh, the opportunity to get the best coaches uh, for the development and actually a place to grow and uh, actually dream to become one of the best in their game in football. And that's quite sad to see when you're actually in a country which has a lot of democracy and who's coming a far away uh, talking about equality because I experienced um, Germany, I experienced uh, France and it's quite, it's quite different talking about politics and equality, but in football part, uh, they're so much further than again. Because I'm in Lyon and we have such amazing conditions to perform at the highest level. So I always ask myself, why, why isn't that the case in Norway then? So what do you think just fans of the game can do to try and, try and change that? Or who, how do you get to a place where you can influence? those kind of opportunities? Yeah, I mean, getting a Ballon d'Or can change something, I think. <laughs> I hope so. Um, and I, that's what I felt in the moment as well. I, I always said that they were, that night was much bigger than me again, because it was a night for us all. And that's the true story from the bottom of my heart, because um, that was a win for women in general, but also in women's football. Um, and young girls can actually dream of a Ballon d'Or, which I never could when I was younger. Um, but it's all about using the voice in the right direction. I know that getting a ball on the door puts me in a spot where I can use my voice and have that ability to change stuff. Uh, th so that's what I'm trying to do every day in training, first of all, keep on scoring the goals. That's my job, basically. <laughs> but uh, also, yeah, change something. And it's funny because someone asked me the other day, like uh, a journalist asked me, uh, do you consider yourself as a feminist or do you consider yourself as a football player? And I was like, it's impossible to not miss the part as a feminist in, in football. Because uh, football, um, you meet challenges uh, every day uh, and it's all about facing those in a, in a good way to change stuff. But post band or now you've kind of become at least a figurehead for women in football. Do you feel any pressure regarding that or have you found it daunting at all to now kind of take on that mantle and role? I must uh, say honestly that I kind of needed uh, that moment to uh, keep working hard. Because uh, sometimes uh, the motivation and the will needs to come from the bottom of your heart and yourself, but sometimes you also need some external factors to keep pushing you and that Ballon d'Or really pushed me uh, to keep going, to be honest. Um, I always put a lot of pressure on myself in the way I analyze myself, uh, the work uh, I put down. So I never like um, saw the reason of taking on pressure from the outside, uh, which could be a good, uh, um, good side of it. Um, so I always need that the pressure I put on myself um, it's important that I develop. Uh, I don't use that much energy that what other things about what I do. So have you found it easy kind of taking on the mantle of fame and letting that reinforce and back up your career on the field as well? Do you find there's a synergy between the two? Yeah, I believe so. I think um, 
I mean, the will must be so strong that uh, I always uh, manage to move on, uh, to develop. And sometimes it could be hard. Uh, I found myself after last season, for example, uh, in the summer, I was like, we won everything. Uh, we had a great season. I had a great season personally. And I, I was looking into the wall and I was like, what now? <laughs> you get these moments where you're just like, now I really need to drag myself out, uh, out on the pitch again to start working for new goals. And that could be some tough periods where I really had to find out like, what's the next, what's the next? Um, so that was a tough period for me. I just I needed some time to like really get back into the game, to find motivation and get that <coughs> hunger back again. So it came slowly and it exposed uh, completely in December with the Ballon d'Or and everything. So. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> what do you think any of the governing bodies of football could do to raise the women's game to the same profile as the men's? Um, I think it's all about... Um, we have the responsibility, of course, of increasing the level in the football. Like, that's our main job, to work as hard uh, to always develop the level at the pitch, us women. Um, but we also need help to develop the products. And there you have all these big organizations coming in, UEFA, FIFA, even France football can make a difference there by putting a ball on, on the map. Um, but I mean that uh, we need also help um, to lift the products uh, in the way of investments, uh, in the way we look at women in, in football, because um, it's not going to do itself. And we're in, in 2019, so why shouldn't uh, women have the same opportunities? Absolutely. And then my final question before we start taking some from the floor is, do you see that you might take a role in trying to court some of that investment or to try and pursue that directly as opposed to leaving it to the institutions that it's with already? Yeah, that, that's the hard part because I don't communicate or we don't communicate directly with, um, with uh, the men in higher position, you could say. Um, we just try to work hard, to be honest, to be, to be badass on the pitch and, and show good football because it's all about showing good football so that people actually can't miss it at the end. Uh, I always, I always look at what can we do to develop the game, uh, to show the best of, out of ourselves. And um, at the end of the day, that's what counts. We need to show good football so we get people at the game so that people could see uh, the value in investing in us and I think in the end they'll, they can't miss us to be honest. Right so let's take some questions uh, from the floor. Is there a first question anywhere? Yeah. How did you go about sort of liking playing football to sort of becoming professional and making, it, making a career out of it? So were there any sort of big challenges that you had to go when you sort of went professional and to become professional? Um, I think when I was younger, I never considered myself like a women's footballer. I just considered my, myself as a footballer, like uh, just a girl playing football. And um, I grew up in a, a family with a lot of equality and it was quite, quite natural for us, the whole subject. So uh, I think it was more than when I got older, uh, where you feel the whole, you have a lot of situations like where you feel that you don't have the same possibilities in terms of it's 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 so many examples it could be in terms of um getting a good um opportunity to train with a uh, academy or uh, equipment or um, uh, the way your federation look at the women's football uh, and, and those struggles are everywhere even though we find in Lyon and we have uh, amazing um, uh, conditions, uh, you still see a lot of details where you're like, why, why, why is it like that? Uh, and it still amazes me today, to be honest. So sometimes I could be in my apartment and was like, why is it like this? I could be so frustrated. Uh, but at the same time, it doesn't, it doesn't have to kill your spirit though, because uh, then we'll never get someplace. Mm. <laughs> Is there another question? Jump, jump across. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you about your thoughts on the current states, um, or rather the, the, f the, the evolution of, of uh, football. So do you think that things such as physicality, so 
speed and stamina and things of that nature are becoming more important than technique, like dribbling and whatever. I feel like that's that's been a, a trend recently, but I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Mm. I think I think in both in women's and men's football that uh, it's getting physical, uh, better uh, tactics are more and more important. Um, and technique is the basics, but it was some years where I thought like tactics were taking all, uh, all over the game. Uh, I remember watching the Euros uh, in, in France, the men's Euros, and I was like, oh, this is so tactical. <laughs> there were no goals and there were 0-0, zero, 1-0. Zero, so when we got the World Cup last year and we had so many goals, I was just like, hallelujah, that's the spirit, you know? Um, but it's the same in women's, um, women's side as well. I think that people are getting more physical, uh, tactics are more and more important, uh, technique is more and more important, and that shows that um, you develop something. Um, and you see that more and more clubs um, get on a higher level, uh, get the same possibility to get on a higher level. So when you get women training every day, it's obviously going to get better as well, I think. I think I think in the end it's um, important to have competence as well, like have uh, good educated <coughs> coaches um, where also we can have uh, the best coaches to pick amongst because that's an important part of it as well. Mm. How do you see that changing though, so that the incentives are there for coaches and <coughs> um, physios and the rest of the apparatus of football changing over from pursuing the men's side to the women's side? I mean, like we're in um, we're in a kind of uh, mixed men's women's team in Lyon now, and and I think that we have a president, Jean Michel Lass. He really believed in that of having a <coughs> women's team and a men's team on the, kind of the same level. So we train together, uh, like not mixed teams, but we train on uh, the same pitch and uh, we eat at the same club. Uh, we share the same uh, area. Uh, which shows a modern way to, um, yeah, control a club, you could say. Uh, and the more and more people see that modern way of um, running a football club, I think more and more people are going to be interested about it. Because I think the, the, the city of Lyon is quite proud to have that women team and men team in the same club. Um, and you can see that it attracts a lot of people. Do you think that's something that's going to start happening soon? That other clubs around Europe and indeed the world start looking at this kind of setup and format and start trying to copy it? I think I think it could be a good image for for everyone. I think it could be a good image for the club side, the men's side, and women's side. Uh, I think um, women can. Uh, help on the result side, get, creating a good boss in the club, and then you also have the men's side. So if like if some of the teams have a bad day, you always have another team backing up, maybe with results or anything. Uh, but you, you, you see that uh, it's still a big difference talking about economy and, and money and salary. And it's never been about um, not respecting the men's what they earn, because I uh, completely respect what they what what their salaries are or um, maybe they're a little bit high sometimes we can discuss that later but i i respect the work they put down because they worked a lot hard to get there uh, so it's never about like um, being angry of what the men's sides uh yeah earns or something like that it's just about putting the women's even more up and make the difference a little bit smaller I think that's an important fact. Do you take another question from the floor? Yeah, so we'll jump to you at the back and then we'll come to you, Shine. Um, this gentleman there. Hi, um, so I know that you mentioned earlier, you were saying, you know, that you found that, like, you know, your career was, you know, a lot shorter than you thought it was. Um, and I know it's sort of maybe early days, but have you had any thought to what you might want to do post football? Because um, I know with football, with sort of an early retirement age, a lot of times people, um, it's sort of a big question what they would do when it ends. So just wondering if you had any ideas about that. I was like, no, don't <laughs> ask me that question. <laughs> no, it is a good question though. Um, I don't know, to be honest. Um, I always had that attitude of I'm going to do 100%, uh, take care of the career I have. But I also know the importance of always had that um, 
yeah, what to do after your career thought in your head. Um, but I'm, I'm, I feel really privileged to have experienced so much that I experienced with football. Like only sitting here f today for me is, is amazing. Um, but being able to have uh, learned languages, uh, I went to Germany when I was young. Uh, learned German, the culture over there. I uh, went to France, uh, learned French, which gave me tons of experiences. So I hope I can use kind of what I've experienced with the football and make something out of it after the career as well. Uh, don't know wh where that will bring me, but I hope that it brings me some, some way at least. Mm. And then let's jump to the hand. Yeah, you sir. And then we'll go to Shiny. Um, what would you say needs to be done to promote the women's game more internationally? Because obviously there are large parts of the world where cultural and social norms mean that women are even like, just don't play football at all. Like, do you think there are any ways to improve that? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's such a big sub subject to discuss. I feel because where to start when people don't even want to let their girls play football uh, and that's kind of the basic series that change those attitudes like a uh, girl or boy they should uh, have the same possibility if you want to do school do school if you want to play football play football and um, changing those attitudes is first step I feel and then uh, you have all these hundred steps after but um, I mean it's all over the world basically uh, and that's why it's so important that women speak up. Women speak up and say that it's not okay, I want to play football or uh, you back each other, I think it's really important. Um, but we also need help to make a movement, as I said earlier. You need federation coming up, uh, valuing women playing football um, so that younger girls can get a better future. Because I know that what I do today could make a difference for the ones coming after. I just have to yeah, don't be afraid to use that voice. It could be scary sometimes though, like talking about all these subjects. You always have someone who wants to, who, not, who doesn't agree with you, or you, may, you might be afraid to get consequences, but I think it can change a lot just speaking up. Mm. Um, so so I'm, uh, I'm from China, and like the first time I heard about like football players was I heard of the name of like Messi or Cristiano Ronaldo. So my question is, do you think um, it will be good for women's football if there's like such a, a superstar that is so well, uh, well known like in the world that like will be an icon for women's football? And do you believe you can become like such an icon? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do know. <laughs> yeah. No, but um, uh, it's important to have um, people looking up, up to. Uh, I look up to Messi and Ronaldo, <laughs> who spit to me. <laughs> um, and creating profiles like that in women's game is really important um, to show the best image of the sport uh, so that people get dragged more into it. Um, and hopefully by performing, I hope that we can create those profiles. What you achieve on the pitch, which is the most important thing for me. I can sit here and talk all day long, but I will miss 50 chances in front of goal. I wouldn't bring me anything, I think. So I, it's all about performing and from that performance, create all these profiles. Is that, we'll jump to the hand behind. I guess on that note, um, is, there, is it what's been your like most proud game that you've played or the game that you, you're most happy that, with your performance? Um, good question. I need to like think of it, but... Um, I must say, uh, scoring a hat-trick against PSG my first time, that was a big moment because PSG is our biggest rival. <laughs> um, but also um, last year's Champions League final because uh, it was a tough game. We went to extra time uh, and we won 4-1 in the end and we won the Champions League the third time in a row. And I actually beat the personal or the record of most score, uh, scored goals in a tournament, so it was, a, it was a big moment, I must say, that one as well. How do you find it coming down off the back of such a success like that? Is it difficult? Do you not really feel that as a problem? Or? Uh, first you're flying, you're flying, and then you have so much adrenaline, and then it hits you, bam! <laughs> and um, 
but uh, it, um, when I was younger, I was a bit too much a rush to the next thing. Like I didn't stop and really enjoy it enough. So my mom and dad used to tell me like, now you need to take it easy, chill a bit and uh, take it easy before you attack new goals, you know? Uh, but now I'm more like, oh, give it to me. <laughs> Let me enjoy it, you know? Uh, so I just try to like every win and every achievement from now on, I just let it sink in as long as possible. Uh, at the same time, try to move on, but extreme adrenaline that makes you tired uh, one day like that, yeah. So jump to another question. Yeah, you said the back. Who were your role models when you were growing up and when you were getting into football? Uh, role model, my mom, <laughs> who's here. <laughs> no, but uh, in football I had um, tons of role models. So, like, I look, like to look up at a lot of different players. I looked at Thierry Henry in Arsenal. Um, when they were at the top, um, I looked at a lot of Champions League, Barcelona. Also Milan, and obviously I looked a lot about uh, Messi and Ronaldo, I must say. I, I just try to say that we're really lucky to have them both at the same time. Uh, I think they uh, have some extremely out of the wor this world talents, um, and they are the best at the moment, both mentally and off on the pitch. So those are kind of the two I get inspired of. And then we'll jump to Cindy. Um, you opted not to play for the Norwegian national team and taken on the Norwegian Football Federation on certain issues related to women's football. Uh, what do you think are the like main structural changes needed in Norwegian women's football for you to reconsider the national team again? Um, I'm not considering the national team again. I, I took that decision. I was quite confident with it. It was a burden uh, I had uh, since years, since I was young. Uh, and it's kind of like the feeling that I had was being put in a system, like an object in a system that I didn't feel like myself. And when I don't feel like myself, I don't even perform. So at a certain point, I was, I was at this road, uh, which which um, which way to to move on, and I had to take that decision to stay on the highest level in my career, and only that for me shows that something is not working on functionally. Um, so they have a lot of to work on in the way they look at the women's football section, how serious they take it, organization, preparation, and analyze, which I was quite clear of when I talk with them taking my decision. Um, so the most important thing for me was that I told them what I felt didn't work. And for, for them, it's up to them to take it and consider it what they want to do with those points. Uh, um, but um, today I'm like, it's kind of a chapter that goes behind me. So I'm kind of looking always in the present and the future what I can do now. Um, and play and play club football, which is my ambition at the moment. Did that sadden you having to take that decision? Oh no, uh, it was uh, once I took that decision, the burden was gone. Like I had uh, some tough nights before take uh, like before really being confident with the decision. And once uh, the decision was made, I could sleep again. Uh, I could feel uh, calm again. So um, I think it's quite sad from, to not play for my country, I must say. Uh, but at the same time, even though if I don't play for the national team, uh, I still kind of play for my country uh, abroad in another country. Um, and that's the most important thing for me. Uh, I'm really proud to be a Norwegian out in the world, big world, uh, to represent my country. So. Um, even though if I don't play for the national team, that that, that pride, that proud feeling doesn't doesn't we get weaker. Do you feel that it's a problem that the international game, both for men's and women's, is secondary to the club level, or do you think that's a strength of international football? I think that's a normal thing because uh, you're with your club every day. You that's it's in the club where you put the um, the work down. Uh, I would say, and then you have games and some gatherings with the national team sometimes in the year. Uh, 
But in the club, you always gather all of the best players from all over Europe, all over the world. So you, you get the best of everything, basically. And then um, you work there every day. So I feel that's kind of a normal, normal balance of it. Is there any other question? Jump to another question. <laughs> I guess who's the best player that you've played with? Oh, good question. Um, I play with a lot of good players at the moment, I would say. But um, playing with Camille Abouli, a French, uh, French legend, and of course uh, Lotte Chalene was a, who was a big idol of for mine of mine uh, since I was little. Those have been two great players, but also great characters for the women's football. And I was lucky to play for, uh, with them before they ended their career, so I must, must mention those two. Should you jump to another question? Yeah, the hand at the back. Um, have you ever thought about um, quitting football during your career? Like, especially in women's football, I understand that um, there can be many bumps in the road towards like, being a professional. I was just wondering if at any time you doubted yourself enough to want to kind of leave the professional game and turn your back on it. I never doubted myself uh, or wanted to leave the game, but I had days where I really felt so frustrated, where I just want to drop the mic and I'm off, I'm going home. <laughs> uh, but I think all of us have those days. I think all of us have those days in, in life in general. Uh, it's 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 challenging sometimes, like uh, not only in my role in women's football or in football, but uh, about dreaming and working hard for something. You can have crap days, and but um, sometimes the feeling of injustice could uh, uh, yeah could make me really frustrated. Um, but then I just call my mom as, as fast as I can and just get the frustration out and move on. Um, but it, it's, it's a good phrase that you told me as well. It's all about um, the goal in life needs to be about being comfortable in not comfortable situation, if you know what I mean, uh, where you're in top situation and you still can yeah, uh, take on the challenge and, and survive them. I think that's a, that's a pretty cool phrase uh, of attacking life in a cool way. Got another question? Jump to the hand. Um, I was thinking back to what you said earlier about, you know, raising the profile. And um, the one sport that I was thinking of, I would say tennis. I would say you could probably say that in tennis, the sort of levels of sort of, you know, um, fan base is maybe somewhat equal between the men and the women. And do you think that there are any lessons that football could learn from tennis um, in trying to raise the profile of um, the women's sport? That's a really good thought, because uh, I think um, they've made something, they made it kind of in tennis, the tennis world. Especially when you're at your highest level, uh, you can see that the quality is better and better the higher level it gets and shows that they made it kind of in some way. Uh, and I think um, you have such a big business in the football's world now where you are, you're talking about such a huge amount, amount of, of money, um, and especially in the men's game. And I think it's impossible to change that in some kind of way because uh, it's all about there's so much money at risk uh, and and you can see it on the transfers on the salaries they're only getting bigger and bigger and i was like well it's gonna explode one day because they're getting so high uh, so i'm just trying to look at look at how little percentage of those money you could invest at the women's side to give them the same opportunity and they wouldn't even notice it. So there's a lot of things there that I think about that I, doesn't make sense. Uh, but that's where why we're here today, just to perform and, and try to make that difference so that in the future they'll understand that those two percentage or one or zero, zero point five could make the whole difference in our women's game.
Do you think it's regrettable that football has become so commercialised and so focused around money? I mean, it's the best sport though. <laughs> no. Um, yeah or no, because uh, it's such a global sport. That's the best thing with football, because you shouldn't forget that. Uh, it's a beautiful sport. Um, you gather a whole world with it. Uh, it's a team sport, well, which makes it even cooler. And it's, it's something beautiful with it. And you can discuss football in so many different uh, subjects and parts of the world. Uh, which I find so interesting because all you need is a ball uh, at your feet. Uh, it doesn't cost a lot normally. I didn't get the most expensive equipment when I was younger. They shouldn't do that either, by the way. <laughs> but uh, um, that's why it gets so big as well, I think, for people. Because you have more and more commercial getting in, um, more and more interest, uh, bigger um, things at risk. Uh, so I'm just, I'm, it's kind of, f yeah, scary to see that it's pointing higher and higher uh, every year. Um, but I just hope that we can jump onto that uh, plane <laughs> where they just cruise and we can join that trip, uh, us women as well. Let's jump to another mm. question. Um, Muhammad Ali famously stated that he hated every single second of training. I was wondering <laughs> what your approach to it is. Do you like it? Do you find it repetitive? <laughs> oh, if I hated training that bad, I think I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> but um, um, I love, I love um, working, like training with quality uh, to um, succeed. I get a lot of confidence when I succeed with something that I worked on for a very long time. But uh, some days are tough. <laughs> some days are so tough where you just have to drag yourself um, through it. Uh, but I think that's a part of it, to be honest. Uh, I don't know about Muhammad, but uh, if he really hated training that much, he must have a insane mentality, <laughs> to be honest. But uh, I love I love football. I love um, I love scoring goals. I love um, playing in a team where you work for the same ambitions. Uh, I love build-ups. I love yeah passing. I love everything about it. So um, just trying to always remember that the passion I have for it, even though I have crappy days as well. Oh, so many uh, of them. You you have no idea. <laughs> but I'm just trying to always remind myself of the goal and where I want to wanna get. I think Muhammad did that as well, <laughs> to be honest. Do you find that the passion is constant or do you find that you've, you've ever had days where you've doubted the passion or that it just stays there as a mm. bright light? Um, there have been days where I thought how many years I'm going to uh, have the energy or the spirit to try to keep on the highest, stay on the highest level. And that's a lot of about the in inequality, to be honest, because there's so many fights to take on that sometimes I just want to go home and <laughs> start, uh, start, start studying or something. But at the same time, uh, I feel really privileged to be a football player, uh, to, to <coughs> be able to live of playing football, experience amazing things, amazing people. I made friends for life through clubs and football. Um, so it's kind of, some days could be hard, but at the end of the day, I, this is what I, what I want to do. And I know it's for a certain period, so that can help sometimes as well. How do you keep your head in the right kind of space and how do you make sure that you're mentally prepared for all of this? Um, a lot of mental preparation, I must say, I, I am. I visual, visualize a lot. Um, I work with a mental coach, uh, a woman, <laughs> uh, and she's great. She helps me kind of find the tools to mental, mentally prepare um, for training, for big games, uh, for everything. Um, but also experience-wise, you, you learn a lot by yourself how to react in different situations. That also helps me be prepared when I'm also not prepared, if you know what I mean. Mm. Do I see the, any, any other questions? Do you have a hand over there? 
Are there any s- new countries or new leagues that you'd want to sort of experience in the future? Because obviously women's football is very international mm. and there's a lot of good leagues all over the world. Is there anywhere that you could see that you'd want to try in the future? Yeah, that's the fun part of it because uh, I don't know uh, where women's football will be in three years again. Uh, hopefully it will be massive exposure everywhere and clubs uh, getting on uh, to fight to to have big professional clubs. Um, but now I'm in Lyon, I really like it there. I uh, try to perform as good as possible, uh, win titles. Um, I have two more years left. So it's hard to think about. I, like, I only, almost try to think like, not, not um, or I try to remember when we train next Monday. So I like, <laughs> I always try to live in the present, but I think it would be interesting to see what US had to offer one day, maybe like kind of an adventure. Um, but that's kind of in the long future yet. So how hopeful are you that in a couple of years time we will reach this big revolution in women's football? Or do you still feel as though it's something that you've got to keep working towards? Um, I think we make small steps in the right direction and then there can be some setbacks. Um, but um, there's more and more interest, I guess. Uh, you can see some crazy um, stats of people watching a game in, in Spain, like they had 48,000 coming for a local derby between Atletico Madrid and Atletico Bilbao. And that just shows that it's possible. Um, you have the FA Cup final in England, which is really big, you like 30, 40,000, which is amazing. Um, and you have, we had a record of 22,000 people in our stadium against PSG once. So you see that it's possible. It's all about creating it more and more. Um, so I hope uh, as fast as possible that we get those stats up because I can, I can feel it when playing in front of 10,000 instead of playing a, in front of hundreds, that's, that changes a lot. And that changes the product as well. Because um, the surroundings are much more attractive. That makes the people come to the game even more when there are 10,000 other people showing up. It's like a cultural moment, you could say. So that's something I really cross, cross my fingers for. Let's jump to another, another question. Uh, do you think that being Norwegian has impacted your career in any way? Um, coming from a small village in Norway uh, gave me something. Yeah, I, I grew up in a family in a small village. gave me that. Yeah, now I can say that growing up in a small uh, town <laughs> uh, and achieve what I've achieved shows that anyone can achieve, I feel. But at the same time, uh, we also had to move from Norway, or I had to move from Norway to kind of get new challenges in the way I look up at the world, uh, the way I look at uh, my career. Uh, but I think being born in a democracy as Norway has uh, formed me as a human, formed me as a woman. Um, and I see, especially when I got uh, abroad, that we have fantastic conditions in Norway. So I'm definitely gonna gonna move back one day for sure. Um, but it's also cool to be on the region in the big world as well, because we're a small country, and I feel that I res- represent something big that is small, you could say. Um, so so yeah. Should we jump to another question if we have one? Yeah. You were talking about changing attitudes earlier and even, you know, you getting b- the ball on the or is obviously very, very big. It changes a lot of uh, the perception of women's football. But even at that ceremony, you, you got a question you would, never ab- you would never have gotten if you were a man. And what does, that, uh, m- what does that tell you about what's required to change his attitude towards women's football? Uh, I think he was really unlucky that night. <laughs> I don't think he has a career anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I mean, in the moment when I stood there, I was just, I, uh, I didn't realize uh, how people were looking at that uh, sentence. I was just like, no way I'm gonna twerk in front of millions of people on the telly. It wasn't a subject. Um, but later I could see that it created a lot of buzz, which was totally fine, because that shows that people are on their toes coming to comments like that, shows that we're maybe come a far away where people react. Uh, but at the same time, I was like, there are more serious subjects to talk about uh, than that incident. But it was just um, unlucky because it was a ballon d'or and the question should never have been there in the first place. Uh, even though it was for Modric or Mbappé or, Mo or me. So I think he had a had a hard time after after that uh, incident. <laughs> <laughs> Let's jump to another question, if we've got one. Um, you were talking about sort of fans in women's football earlier. Do um, you think there's an opportunity for women's football to sort of create a slightly different atmosphere than the men's game? I mean, men's, the men's fans are generally quite male and sort of like can be can be in some cases quite aggressive. Do you think it, there's more of an opportunity for women's football to sort of progress in a sort of more family friendly way than in the men's game, in, especially in the fan base? I hope so. I hope that more and more women go to the men's games as well. That you create kind of a more equal, like not more equal, but I hope that women enjoy watching football live as the men's do, uh, and that the same crowd will show up, uh, up at our games. Uh, and I think we have like our men's supporters. Uh, we always try to drag them at our games because it's, it's that atmosphere you want, you know. Um, that kind of rough, uh, it could be a rough culture as well, but we're not that used to it, so we love it when we first have it. Uh, so we, every time we play PSG away and they have their ultras at the game, it's kind of like, whoo! <laughs> but it's, it's great, we get pumped uh, about it. Um, so I hope that we can attract more and more women, women and men to, to our game. Because um, I want women also to show up at games and see how, how great it is. Because um, it's a sport for both sexes. I think people, everyone has understood that now <laughs> with all my talking. But, uh, but it's important, yeah. And I think because we're coming to the hour mark, we've got time for one final question, if there is one. Um, what, what do you think it is about the French uh, sporting fans as a whole, as a, as a nation, that um, really gets behind women's sports? I mean, football obviously, but with rugby union as well, like that's massive in France in comparison to a lot of other countries, but the numbers of actually going to games is a lot higher in France than, in, so let's say, England, for example. Mm. Is there anything that you, well, say you're living in France and being part of that, is what is a something about French? I mean, they're really passionate about f uh, sport or football and rugby. That's like yeah. the two main sports they're really passionate about. So, like in culture and historical uh, way, they always been loving it. I think I think they're gonna love the women's game more and more as well. Mm. Um, I kind of think that it's been a lot about the men's as well in sports in France, but they can see that they show up more and more at the women's side of it as well. So it kind of like uh, goes in the right direction. Um, but obviously they have some great national teams as well and great players, so why shouldn't they be passionate about it? And that's the same on, the, on both sides, um, both men and women. Well, so touching it to end on. Mm. Um, so that is all we have time for. Ladies and gentlemen, please do join with me in thanking. Thank you.